Hello, croissant lovers. It's Anna Olson here, and we are live. I am so excited to be here with you sharing how to make croissant. And now this is a live demo. Perhaps some of you, especially those who joined me for the bake along last week, have measured some ingredients so that you can make these croissants along with me. I will be very clear that I'm going to go through every active step of making these croissants in the next hour. So you actually can make croissant in an hour. The only thing is, it's all that passive time in between. When you're making croissant, you spend, you know, 10 minutes here, five minutes there, another 10 minutes here. It adds up to an hour, but you want to spread to make the best croissant with the best flavor, uh, the flakiness. You want to give yourself two and a half to three days. So those who might be baking along with me, um, you're going to make part one of the recipe, and then you can come back to this video to pick up each and every point along the way. So that means I have a lot of croissant stages going on over here and over here, but we're going to start right here. And what really makes um, this special, because perhaps you have watched my 11 minute croissant video um, on, the Oh Yum YouTube channel right here is I go through all the steps, but I've learned a lot more. And in spending an hour together live, I'm going to give you some real insight and even new knowledge. Because every time I make a recipe, I challenge myself to make it better, to try something new and really just go for it. So just like when I was making my scones, these croissants that are going to go in the oven will leave us, because I'm live baking, <laughs> will leave us with 20 minutes, 18 to 20 minutes, to do some Q&A towards the end of the session. But let me get right into it with the dough. So I have already measured 525 grams, three and a half cups of all-purpose flour into my mixing bowl. Yes, you can do this by hand, but for the sake of time, I'm going to use the mixer. Um, you can use bread flour, which has a higher protein content, and it can it really develops the glues to hold the butter in to your croissanto. But I have had great success using all purpose. Now, another question um, I've often been asked is, can you use whole wheat flour? And you can up to a point. In conventional baking, if I'm making banana muffins or something along those lines, I will substitute up to 50% whole wheat flour, but because of the de delicate nature of croissant, I will really only do about 30%. So you get some nice texture, the kind of toasty nuttiness of the whole wheat flavor in the, in the croissant, but you don't want to replace it 100%. Now, croissant dough, the base dough, there are two parts. You've got the détente, the base dough, and then the bourrage, the butter part. I'm adding a little bit of sugar to the dough, and then I have my yeast. Um, the recipe calls for a packet, which is the equivalent of two and a quarter teaspoons. I don't know about you, but yeast is getting tougher to come by just <laughs> in recent weeks. So I'm conserving a little bit. I've actually been using one and a half, two maximum, and giving the croissants a three-day ferment, I haven't found any issue whatsoever. The one thing I haven't tried is using a sourdough starter in my croissant dough. It can be done, and there's some good recipes out there if that is, if you don't have instant dry yeast, that's what uh, you might want to use. If you have conventional yeast, what you'll want to do is actually dissolve the yeast in your liquid first for about three minutes, then you add it to your dough base. This is instant, so it goes right into the mixing bowl. And then I've got a combination, 250 ml or one cup of warm water and half a cup of 2% milk. 1% is fine, whole is fine. Just you, you want that milk. It lends a nice softness to the dough. So that's 125 ml. Now I'm going to mix this just to combine all the ingredients. It'll just take a minute or two. And if you were doing this by hand, what you would want to do is have a big bowl, a wooden spoon, really stir it around until there is no more um, open flour or, or dry flour. Then you tip it out onto a work surface and you start kneading it lightly. Just letting this pull together. 
this is really nice. You know, there's nothing overly complicated or technical in a single step when it comes to making a croissanto. It's really just the combination of taking the time and letting the magic happen through each step and giving each step time in between. So you can see this makes a rather nice and soft dough. There, it's starting to pull together now. And this is the point where I let the dough sit for a little bit. Now, this is something new in the previous recipe. Um, when it comes to bread baking, and if anyone's doing sourdough at home or the no knead bread, there's a process that happens when it comes to uh, making a dough that if you let it sit for, it can be three, four minutes. It can be up to 20 to 30 minutes. With the yeast, what is very important is you don't add the salt. So you notice I added flour, sugar, yeast, water, and milk. That was it. And this process of just letting it sit, this is what you have to do, whether mixing by hand or a mixer, is you do nothing. And this enzymatic process is called autolyze. And what is happening is the flour is hydrating. So what that does is it helps the protein strands within the flour bond to create a nice strong dough. So when you work in the butter, it holds it and keeps it in place. So really, it's just simply a matter of time. So as I'm chatting to you, this magic is already happening. The key is not to add the salt because salt, to pull out a technical term, is hydroscopic. It pulls moisture towards itself, so away from the flour. That's why you wait to add the salt until later on. I think in my excitement of um, getting ready, I might have overmeasured my liquid. So I'm going to add a little more flour just to bring it together. What you want out of the dough is to have it clean the sides of the bowl. Oh, yeah, there we go. If you were to bake up this dough without adding the... Uh, rolling the, the butter, you'd pretty much have a nice soft bun that would work, you know, double as a hamburger bun. Um, not a full milk bun. It wouldn't be super soft or rich, but it'd be a lovely dough. There we go. We're cleaning the sides. Now I can add my salt because in that couple minutes of chatting, we're good. That's one and a quarter teaspoons of salt and just a touch of butter, two tablespoons which is the equivalent of 30 grams. I'm gonna to toss that in there. And at this point, once you've added your salt and your butter, you can increase the speed if you're using a mixer because the auto lies, that gluten development is already happening. So just a quick mix and you're done. Don't worry, I'm coming back. <laughs> I just want the dough to pull away from the sides. There we go. Clean the sides of the bowl, but it should still stick to the bottom of the mixer. How's everyone doing? Good? Having a good day? Oh my goodness. I love that we're just so excited about baking and we're applying ourselves using the extra time we might have without traveling the way we used to, to take on projects like this. So as a note, while I'm letting this mix, I'm gonna take a quick look to see some of the questions that I'm getting. And just to say hello to everyone, I'm looking at the screen here. So, uh, doo -doo -doo. oh, South Africa, I saw notes from Hungary, from Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, you're staying up late, aren't you? Um, I saw notes from across Canada, hello, and from the US. Oh, that reminds me, before we got going, I saw a question come in about altitude baking uh, from Denver, Colorado, which is a very good question. And for people uh, in Calgary, Alberta, um, again, part of the Rocky Mountains, you have the same question, you're baking at high altitude. The key to success when it comes to altitude baking is 
me. I think I missed a cup of flour when I measured. <laughs> see, this is the joy of live baking with me. <laughs> you see that actually it's not perfect all the time. I'm gonna add some more flour. I think I miscounted <laughs> when I started. This is the real deal. I'm getting more flour. I'll be right back. Wow. I'm not sure if you can hear Michael talking, but my sweetie Michael is running the cameras right now. So hopefully we can zoom in on some of the work we're doing. We won't zoom in on the fact that I mismeasured my flower to start. <laughs> you know, sometimes the, those happy accidents yield really interesting surprises. But I, three days work, I don't want interesting surprises. So if you do the same thing as I do and you mismeasure, you're trying to do two things at once, what you're looking for is a dough that is elastic and cleans the side of the bowl. All right. Bologna, Italy. Woo, Bologna, Italy. Hello. Okay. I said I was going to talk about high altitude baking, so I got to get to this. This is what I'm multitasking here. Now, the key when it comes to high altitude baking is you've got reduced air pressure because you're higher up. That means there's less resistance in the air. Water boils at a lower temperature. And when you add yeast, baking soda or baking powder to any of your baking, there's less resistance, even eggs, and things will lift up really quickly if you're following conventional recipes. But before everything has had a chance to set, you'll find that cakes sink in the center, um, things take longer to bake, or they come out dry and crumbly. So the quick fix solution, um, there are equations you can find out with, that you can look up online that give you the calculation depending on your exact altitude. But essentially what you need to do is lower your leavening. So reduce the amount of yeast, baking powder, baking soda. You also need to add a little extra liquid. And that buys time as your baked goods are in the oven for them to come together, lift and hold and set. But you don't change the oven temperature at all. So reduce your leavening, increase your liquid a bit and you'll have better luck. So I hope that really walks you through. As a little tip, I went to cooking school in Colorado, in Vail. And I learned how to cook and bake at 8,000 feet above sea level. So I had firsthand experience with that. All right, this, and now I'm happy with this dough. This feels good. Now it is soft, it really is soft. It's, once we add the butter, it really sets up here. I'm just gonna get this out of the way. And I just wanted, Mix it by hand for a second, just so I can show you. It's one thing to see it in the machine. And I will bring the machine back in a second for my butter. But I want you to get a sense of this consistency. Once you flour your hands, see it's quite smooth and elastic and flexible, but it is soft now because it's at room temperature. In fact, it's a little bit warm because my water was warm to activate the yeast. Once you put this in the fridge, everything cools down and that little bit of butter in there sets out and you'll find it's softer and easier to handle. So just a little work there. You can see it's got a nice stretch to it. It's elastic, but it's soft. So now I wanna coax this yeast to life. I want it to feed on the sugar and the flour in here and develop some flavor. So I'm just going to set it in a bowl and I leave this at room temperature for 90 minutes. Then what I do is I'll flatten it out into just a rectangle and I'll put it in a square pan, uh, just like this. And then I'll put it in the fridge, minimum one hour, but up to eight hours. So when you're choosing to make this recipe, Figure out the time when you want to pull those croissants out of the oven, and then you can work backwards to figure out how much time you need. I like to give you some wiggle room. I don't want you getting up at two in the morning because you think you have to go fold your croissants. You've got a minimum an hour, up to eight hours. Really, the longest time is better because you're going to get more flavor, more fermentation, more stretch, more crust. Um, so let that go at room temperature for 90 minutes. Shape it into a square. Pop it in the fridge to chill. Now that's part one of this recipe. Now I'm going to bring the mixer back because part two of the recipe, and this is 
the defining moment. This is where I worked on puzzling through why croissants in France taste so good. And I struggle with replicating them when I'm making them in my own kitchen. Now, yes, part of the reason why croissants in France taste so good is because you're in France <laughs> and you're enjoying them. And you're probably on holiday or eating croissants breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, but there is, there, there's a difference in the butter, North America to Europe. Now in Canada, I can't speak to the States, but I know in Canada, we, um, the butter fat content of our butter, just regular grocery store butter is 80%. Now the difference is most butter in France and in many other countries in Europe, the butter is 82 to 84% butter fat. And you think, really, does that make that much of a difference? Well. Think about the difference between whole milk and skim milk. That's three and a quarter percent. And whole milk is rich and it's got a creamy color to it and it tastes so rich and it, oh, it just makes your tea or coffee delicious. And then you think of skim milk, which my husband likes to call the ghost of milk that died. It's kind of thin and watery and it has no substance to it. So think of that difference applied to butter. Adding that extra 4% fat makes a butter croissant so much better. But what do we do? Here we are in Canada, and especially during these times, yes, you can buy high fat butter. And there's some great brands out there. And just because it's cultured butter doesn't mean it's a higher butter fat. It should state on the package if it is an 82 or 84% butter. But you can't pop out and buy it now. And I was puzzling through what I could do because I have grocery store brand butter, unsalted, and I needed to make these croissants richer. And so I was working my way through and here's, here's my butter. And I was puzzling, well, I could use coconut oil. But then the problem is when you chill coconut oil, it turns rock hard. So that wasn't going to work. Then I didn't really want to use margarine. It's unpredictable by brand. And I didn't want to add salt to the recipe. You could use vegetable shortening but a butter croissant should be a pure butter croissant. And so as I was kind of walking through this in my mind out loud, Michael chimed in from the other room and he said, what about ghee? Game changer. So what I do with this recipe now is I use part, just regular grocery store unsalted butter, 225 grams and ghee, which is clarified butter, now all of a sudden adds that richness. Now, ghee is 100% butter fat. To make ghee or your own clarified butter, you don't have to go out and buy it, you can make it. All you need to do is take regular butter, melt it over low heat, let it cool and sit, and that white liquid that just will sit at the bottom because fat floats to the surface, make sure you don't stir that in, you pull the butter away um, and store it and you'll find you get this beautiful clarified butter. You want to chill it down and it even smells richer. So I know I'm going to get that full butter flavor. This really, I put it to the test and it's amazing how well it works. Um, melting your butter in the microwave is also super simple. It immediately separates. And so that's the best way to make your ghee or clarified butter. Now, what I had to figure out, though, was for the 285 grams or one and a quarter cups that's called for in this recipe, how much of the clarified butter do I add to achieve 84%? And there's a great equation. If, if kids are watching and you need to sort of play with your math a little bit, where did I? There is something called the Pearson square. And this is... Um, Michael was taught this by a fellow professor who then used it as a teaching model to see if I could get this. And this simple square is an amazing way, and you can just look up Pearson Square to figure this out. But by taking what I need in butter at a percentage of fat, you break it down into the corners of this square. So, and you subtract one from the other. It's, it's very clearly explained online. So I figured I needed 80% regular butter, 20% ghee. So that adds up, fortunately, the math is nice and even, one cup of unsalted butter, 
and 60 grams of ghee. Oh, hi, Amy. So Amy Pruel is part of the research um, and development department at Niagara College. She's the one that shared this Pearson Square with Michael, who then taught it to me. And it is a game changer. So you can figure out, like, how do you make 2% milk if all you have is half and half cream? Or if you want to make a richer ice cream, you can't make more fat from less fat, but you can certainly figure out those equations. So if you want to have fun, nerd out. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fant a fantastic tool. It really made things simple for me. So speaking of which, back to my butter. So this is room temperature, unsalted butter, because we're in charge of the salt. And I find unsalted butter is sweeter and fresher tasting. My ghee has been sitting out too. I'm just going to straight measure that into my bowl. But don't worry, if, you, if you're if you baking along with me, and of course, this was a little surprise tip I just threw in there. You can make these croissants using just the one and a quarter cups of regular butter. It is fine. Um, I just love that the, you get that extra buttery flavor and textbook European croissant crispness using uh, the ghee as an addition. All right, now I'm gonna switch to my paddle. I've been talking a lot, I gotta get working. Everyone good? If I was using just straight butter, all I would have to do is beat it to smooth it out and then I'd be shaping it into a square, but I wanna combine the ghee with the unsalted butter so that when I'm working it into the croissant dough, it's nice and smooth. Ah, Bonnie and Bill. Oh my gosh. Okay, so hang tight. Bonnie's a neighbor, lives a few doors down. Thank you for leaving that lovely note at Easter. I was going to actually come by this afternoon because guess what? I'm going to have lots of croissants in a little while. So don't go anywhere. Oh wait, you're not. <laughs> there we go. So I smoothed out my butter. Let me make a little space here. Oh, greetings to everyone. I see lots of notes. Oh, Michael, is there any chance we can bring the camera a little closer? Okay. Well, wait, if TJ says that we should move the camera closer. We just, we don't want to get all wobbly and lose our focus. You can use plastic wrap if you wish. Um, I happen to have parchment here. I mean, these days I'm conserving and recycling and reusing. So if I use a piece of plastic, I try and use it a few times. The same goes for the parchment. And now I just flatten this out a bit. And I'm looking to loosely create an eight inch square, but the parchment paper is pretty much gonna do all the work for me. Let me get every bit of butter here. And you can even use your rolling pin just to flatten it out. A little bit, like so. You'll find that if you use the ghee, because the addition of that 20% of the ghee, it actually creates a butter that's slightly softer once chilled. And that's the difference. If you've ever had the joy of working with um, an 84% butter, it feels softer. It doesn't set up as firmly. So it actually works into the croissant dough far easier than grocery store butter. This I'm gonna pop in the fridge and guess what? Magic of live demo, I already have some made. That's why I have lots of croissants <laughs> ready for the neighbors. Okay, this, now we are literally getting rolling here. So this is the same butter, but chilled so it's firm. And here is my dough. I made this at eight o'clock this morning. 
So it's had just over four hours to sit and see how much it puffs up. I'm going to tip it out. And it really does set up nicely, but it's still soft, pliable, flexible, but it's got a good elasticity to it. And you will find as you're rolling, with each roll and fold, you'll need less flour and less flour to keep your dough from sticking. You see those air bubbles popping out? Now, I don't need to roll this terribly thin at this point. Yeah, that's about how much butter I like to put on my croissant. <laughs> there we go. Now, the key to folding the butter in is not to do square on square, but actually rotate so that when you bring your dough together, pinch out any air bubbles. You've got this nice little envelope. And now we're ready to do the very important first fold. So you wanna work in slow little motions so that you're not shattering the butter within the dough, but actually working to spread it out. When you're making um, croissant dough by hand, it's actually easier to do this rolling and folding than it is when you're making puff pastry, which tends to be a, a more dense and tighter dough with a little more butter. Um, and it's really a workout to do by hand. But with croissant, I find it's a lot easier. Now, your butter will break into pieces. It's just the nature of it a little bit, and it's supposed to. But this is why you have multiple folds. So if you feel hunks of butter in there, you, it's okay. You're, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Now what I'm going to do now is roll this into quite a long rectangle. In a commercial bakery, you would have a machine that actually does this. It's called a sheeter and you feed it through and it's like a giant pasta roller. You know, when you feed in the pasta dough and it gets thinner and thinner, it's the same idea. It just presses the dough and the butter quickly and evenly through. When you're doing it by hand, it's slightly more inconsistent, but the result will be the same. There, now that I've got the butter moving, can really push this dough out. And the butter actually helps keep the dough in place. And another little tip that I've picked up in handling laminated doughs like this, laminating being you put the fat in layers over it, is I think this is from my wedding cake fondant rolling days, but I like to give the croissant dough a little massage and it just softens that butter just a little bit so that when you do the folding, it, it just breaks down a little more smoothly. Okay, let's get these ends rolled out a bit. So now the first fold, you could do a three fold, which is one, two, Three. So you've got three layers in there. Then if you did another three fold and another three fold, which you will need to do, that's three, then rolled into three again means nine, into three again means 27 layers. And then you cut that into a croissant and roll it up. So then you get about 100 layers in each croissant. But if you start with a book fold, that gives you four layers, four then with a three fold, times three equals 12 layers, times another three equals 36 layers. All of a sudden you get some extra layers of flakiness in there. So that's why I'm opting for the book fold. 
Now, what I like to do, if you do a book fold, originally I was taught to do it like this. But you'll notice the end pieces, this is the first fold. The butter doesn't go right to the end yet because it just hasn't had a chance to move there. And if I fold it like this, now I've got this big kind of doughy bit stuck right in the corner here. So what you really wanna do when you're doing a book fold is to fold it by a quarter here and then like so. So now this seam is in the middle. So when you do the next fold, it spreads out more evenly. It doesn't get stuck in the corner. You'll have a more consistent and flakier croissant for it. I hope these tips are helpful. Here, I'll just say, take a quick peek. <laughs> do, do, do. Oh, lots of people are just saying hello. Oh, Pro Gamer wants a recipe for boiling water. Oh, that's a tough one. I haven't got there yet. Good question. I'll work on it. I'll work on it. I'm feeling like everyone's in a good mood today. It's Thursday. Lots of greetings from everywhere. Michael's smiling because he knows he gets croissant <laughs> in a little bit. <laughs> Woo! Bonjour à tout le monde. Okay, well, you know what? I'm just rolling for the sake of rolling. I can put this away now. Because I want to show you the next fold, and then we need to get to cutting. Oh, we're good for time. We're good. I'm just going to lay this down. In a commercial bakery, you would put your dough on a, a sheet tray and you have a big rolling rack so you can start stack lots of things on it. When I'm rolling pastry like this at home and I don't want it to get bruised, dented or damaged or, you know, put my chicken leftovers on there, I like to put it in a pan and it just protects it a little bit. Okay, so just like the first dough that you want to, once you chill it, chill it for a minimum of an hour up to a maximum of about eight hours, the same applies here. So you need to let it rest for at least an hour. And that's to let the proteins relax because you just exercise them by rolling them out just like I exercise myself. So minimum an hour, but you've got time. Don't You don't have to um, fret about it at all. And just know the longer it sits, well, the more flavor that develops. You don't want it to go too much longer than eight hours, just because with the repeated folds, you don't want the yeast to all of a sudden expend itself. And then there's nothing left to lift when you put your croissants in the oven. So this goes in the fridge. And surprise, everybody. So I've been making croissant dough for two days now, because that's what you voted for. So here is a croissant that has rested for eight hours. And it's got a different feel and look to it because of the butter in it. Now this one is ready for its final fold. So in this process, you had the first, once you get the butter in there, you fold it once, you let it sit. Then you have to fold it two more times before it's time to cut the croissant. So you can budget that time accordingly with the same time gap, minimum of an hour, up to eight hours. And then this one is ready for its final fold. So you can see, hopefully, can I? Can everyone see okay? You can see where I did a three fold, but you can see there are pieces of butter now visible, but they're quite flat. And that is expected to see in the croissant dough. soft and pillowy. And when you're doing your rolling and folding, you roll and fold in the opposite direction of the previous fold. So you can see I have the seams here. So I wouldn't stretch this out further this way and bring it in. I'm going longer. So then I'll fold this way. I'll do this one relatively quickly. But the same techniques apply. I'll give it a little length. But see how with each rolling, I'm knocking out bits of air. And that is just challenging the yeast. It'll come back to life. It'll feed, produce more air bubbles, and just improve the flavor and texture at each roll and turn. Ooh, this is feeling good. I love that feel. So again, just like I used to rub fondant, smooth it out. I can really feel it, especially now that I'm getting these thinner layers. 
I can feel it shifting under my hand a little bit. Okay. And did you notice I hardly used any flour in rolling this one? So there we go, a final three fold. I'll let this sit for an hour, up to eight hours, and it's good to go. Smaller pan. Okay, now for the final step. Remember that threefold you have to do twice. And after you've done that final fold, you wanna let it sit a little bit longer. And it really is just about getting the yeast to ferment because now it's time to roll and cut the dough. Now you're probably looking at this going, oh, well, what happened to half the dough? Well, I already have some croissant proofing, so we don't have to wait <laughs> for them. So that is half of this final recipe. This has gone through the book fold, and it is, oh, I'm gonna save that to use it. It's gone through the book fold and the two three folds. So now we're ready to finally roll and cut. And this is half of the recipe, which weighs, you'll find it weighs about 1200 grams. And from a 600 gram piece, I find I get 12 nice size croissant. If you wanna go bigger, you go bigger. Um, but I get 12 really nice, modest, so you don't feel bad if you have two croissant. Three, or as Michael says, 11 teen croissants. <laughs> But it feels, I hope you notice the difference, even from the, um, we're gonna try and get closer if we can. Um, the difference in the texture, like that butter is still visible, but it's just this sheer layer. And you can see cutting into the croissant, that beautiful, the lift is from the yeast right now, but then the little bits of butter are in there. And then what happens is you've got the yeast comes to life in the oven, and then the butter melts, and then the butter, produces steam and that pushes up the flour around it. And so that's why croissant come out so flaky with that beautiful, they need to be a little soft in the center, but shatteringly crispy on the outside. So now this is where a measuring tape comes in handy. I just use a regular fabric measuring tape. Michael's gonna move the camera in so he can see a little more of what I'm doing. But right now I'm just rolling the dough and I'm trying to get it to a rectangle that's 30 by 40 centimeters. That's basically the 10 by 12 inches, I think. Oh, I have a tape, I can check. And now that the butter is in such sheer layers within this dough, it handles so well. It doesn't shrink back. Did you notice when I was first folding that first dough, how it was kind of almost, not rubbery, but elastic and, and it kind of sprung back, which is good. You want it to have that protein, the, the gluten development. But at this point, this is now butter rich. I'm just gonna check my measurements. Got 27 centimeters, 16 inches. So 16 by 12 is what, if you're doing inches, that's what you want it to be. It's good exercise. Oh, it is a good workout. Whew. But it's not a tough dough at all. This is why I like to use a French, a tapered rolling pin, because you can use the curve to coax a corner out of a round, or you can coax, you can make a round out of a square piece of dough just by using that angle and pulling the dough down into the corners. Let's do a quick check. Yep, yep. Now you don't have to trim the edges if you don't wish, but I find I get a, a nicer sort of flaky line to the croissant. But when you're trimming the outside, like barely, barely, barely any. You don't wanna waste any of this dough. This gives you a nice clean edge. So as it rises, it's super, super flaky. Okay, so 
To get 12 croissant from this rectangle, the first thing I'll do is mark, you're okay if I go a little over an hour here? I just, I don't wanna miss a step here and all of a sudden you're wondering what happened. No one's leaving? Okay, good. I'm marking halfway. And you can just use a chef's knife for this, if you wish. And now I am going to cut each half into long rectangles. So. Okay, so now we've got six. And if you wanted to do a uh, pain au chocolat, which is the chocolate filled croissant, that is the rectangle shape, you would cut each of each half into four rectangles like this, put in the chocolate and roll it up. But we're doing the classic croissant shape. So you cut each rectangle into two triangles. And it doesn't matter that they are not isosceles triangles. They don't have to be concentric. They can have that little angle because once you stretch and fold them, you will not see the difference. And if anyone complains, they don't get a close-up. No, you can take a bite out of one end and say, there, I took care of that. Now, I, it, there are different schools in terms of rolling the croissant. I like putting a little notch at the base of the rectangle, because I find when you want it to be moist and soft, but you don't want it to be squishy. And this just creates a nice little gap. So the heat gets in there when it bakes. So I just put that notch is two centimeters max, just over half an inch. Now I'm making a mess. All right, so to coax more layers out of this croissant dough, you wanna stretch as you roll. We've got a good angle here. So first, this little notch helps get things moving. Then take that length of the croissant dough and just pull it right up and there we go. And you want the little end piece to be tucked underneath so that goes on the bottom of the tray. Now something worth noting is in France, it's not a law, but it's an unwritten rule that if you see a straight croissant, it is a butter croissant. In France, if you see a curved croissant like this, it actually signposts that it's made from margarine or shortening. Uh, usually the price difference tells you the same, but it's interesting because it's a different rule than here. So if you're ever buying croissant when you're, when we get to travel back to France, and if you are in France, oh, bless you, enjoy your croissant, um, you'll want to buy these straight ones. So that one I'll leave curved, but my remaining, I will keep straight like this. Now, here's a great discussion point because this recipe makes two dozen large or 30 smaller croissant, depending on what you're after. I We are not in the age of entertaining these days. We have to stay in small groups and uh, stay at home. So what to do with all these croissants? This is the point to freeze your croissant. Just like this, you right from rolling and shaping, you put them in a tray, pop them in the freezer, then you can take them off the tray and pack them into a container and then you thaw them to bake them later on. And I'll, I'll walk you through the baking, the proofing and baking instructions too, from this date and from frozen. I find this activity just absolutely calming and relaxing. Well, the stretch helps get you just have more roll to your croissant, which essentially, this is like the final lamination stage when you think of how many layers just by this shape you get in there. 
So I think I'm going to fit nine on my tray reasonably. You have to leave room. These will virtually double in size once they're baked. So nine is the maximum and I'll freeze. Or no, I'll leave them out. I'll bake a second tray because Bill and Bonnie need some croissant. Taking some to Miranda too. Suzanne and Bruce and Courtney will get some. So now you know what I'm doing this afternoon. Door dropping croissant. Ring the doorbell and run. <laughs> I wish I could come see everyone and drop off croissant. So these all set aside. There we go. So now comes a little more patient. You've been patient so far, all these different stages, but you cannot rush this last step. Where's my tea towel? There it is. You want to let your croissant rise for two hours. And that seems like eternity, but remember these came from the fridge. So the butter needs to soften. The yeast needs to wake up and come back to life. And that takes time. If you are pulling your croissant from the freezer, put them on your baking tray just like this, and you want to give them three hours. Honestly, it takes an hour for them just to thaw and then another two hours to proof up. So I like to do a tea towel or a linen towel first. That plastic I already used. And these go away for a little nap. But don't panic. Here are the croissants. These are from, this is the second half of that batch. And these have been uh, rising for two hours. My oven is preheated to 375. And then the final touch before we put them in the oven is a brushing. You need the brushing of the egg wash. Egg with a little bit of water. This promotes shine and a nice even browning. Actually, let's take a second and I just wanna just show you how you've got that sort of springiness. They've got that poofy look to them. And I just leave these on the counter. I don't wanna put them in too warm of a place and risk melting the butter. Oh, our feed just went out here. We good? Okay, oh, maybe it's my, my own laptop. Oh, someone is asking, IK, uh, egg white only. Yes, you could use egg white only if you wish. Um, you'll get, yeah, you'll get a nice shine. It would work just fine. If you like a really dark croissant, you could do just egg yolk or egg yolk with a little cream. Questions are uh, still coming in. Oh, the Elm says, this is quite a process. Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. But I'm so happy to be able to show it to you. I mean, after all, everybody voted for us overwhelmingly. But you know what? The response was so strong to um, putting the, the survey out there that for the next week, uh, for next week's Oh Yum 101, we're going to put it to a vote again. So you can count on seeing a survey right here on the Oh Yum channel or on my social feeds. So you get to vote again for what I make. Now, I try and post... <laughs> Choices that I know I have the ingredients for. So hopefully, um, yeah, I have a good stock of everything. I have lots of butter, lots of cream. I'm doing okay on flour, though I've used a lot. This is now going into the oven for 15 to 18 minutes. I'll check it at 15. I don't know about you, but I love a really dark croissant. So I might let it go in for just a little extra time. There we go. I'm just going to check my oven temperature. Yep, 375. When you're baking with puff pastry, quite often you'll um, want, um, you'll find that uh, a hot oven, like 400 degrees, that would be 200 Celsius is good. But because of the rich nature of the croissant and the yeast, it over browns, um, especially on the bottom. If you cook it any higher than 375, which would be 190. Celsius. So while those are cooking, I've got a little glass of water here. 
how about I take some of your questions? Because your your baking questions are just absolutely phenomenal. So I want to hear what you want to know. Uh, oh, Benny just asked, have I baked with quinoa flour before? I have. I would say that making a croissant recipe would be a challenge with it because you don't have that protein. I would have to come up with a different ratio. But yes, I do like baking with quinoa flour. It has a beautiful nutty taste um, and works into gluten-free baking along with tapioca starch um, is a good baking, a gluten-free baking option. When I'm using quinoa flour or rice flour or any other gluten-free option, for every one cup called for in a recipe, I usually budget two-thirds of that um, gluten-free ingredient, in this case, quinoa flour, and a third tapioca starch. And that tends to generally be a good starting point for replacing wheat flour in your baking. Great question, Benny. Oh, Patrick Nicholson is asking if I can make a rice mochi. How did you guess that I am actually planning to do a daifuku? Um, a filled mochi recipe for my new series, but oh, that's been put on hold until we can all be safe and healthy again. But I have a delicious mochi recipe. Uh, my sister-in-law is Japanese, so she showed me how to do the daifuku with fresh strawberries inside. So just absolutely amazing. I can't wait to share it with you. Um, great question. Oh, Levi, uh, Levi Myers is asking, can I make your brownies flourless? My friend's practically allergic to every flower out there. You know what, Levi? Brownies are one of the easiest recipes to adapt to gluten-free baking because if you replace the wheat flour, which is usually a small amount in a brownie recipe to begin with, with either ground almonds, more cocoa powder, or a combination therein. You could even use um, brown rice flour. Because of the moisture in a brownie recipe, the rice flour would plump up nicely and you'd find you don't get that grittiness that you sometimes do when you're using rice flour. So that is a great question. Love these questions. Oh, uh, Rajia Hadara is asking, how can we put chocolate inside of the croissant? That's a really great question. Um, when I was cutting the croissant in the triangles, what you would do is actually leave them as rectangles, make them a little bit smaller. So where I got six rectangles, you would want eight. Now in the commercial bakery business, um, there's a special type of chocolate used in chocolate croissant um, and they're called chocolate shocks and they're little sticks and they melt in slightly a different way than just straight chocolate. Um, but you could, you could use, you want to use couverture or good baking chocolate, not chocolate chips. Um, so it melts nicely. Or if you have um, chocolate ganache or you melt chocolate with a little bit of butter and then chill it and then shape that almost like a truffle, but put that in the center, that would work just as well. But good baking chocolate chopped up will do the trick. And you put it right at one end. You don't spread it along the whole croissant. So that way, once it, you roll it, it stays in the center. Great question. Oh, Atana Balan, good question. Fresh yeast versus dry yeast. Fresh yeast is becoming harder to find these days, but if you do, it is delightful. Um, but your weight uh, measurement, fresh yeast is quite substantial. So when you see a recipe call for say eight grams of dry yeast, you would want to use 16 grams of the fresh yeast. Now fresh yeast has to be dissolved in liquid before you add it to anything. So like this croissant recipe, I had my milk and water, stir the yeast into that um, and let it sit for about three minutes as you would uh, dry granulated yeast and then you can add it to your dry mixture. Great question. Uh, Morgan is asking, does the butter have to be cold when laminating? It is best to work with cold butter. Um, and as I mentioned, if you're adding the ghee, the 100% butter to this, you'll find it's a little softer and handles well, well um, where if you're just using 80% butter, it, it'll have a tendency to crack a little bit, but cool or cold is best because if it's too soft, it risks actually getting worked into the dough itself. And then you'll have something that is more the texture of say a cinnamon bun without the cinnamon filling because the butter actually works into the dough itself. You actually need to keep those layers distinct. That was a great question. Um, oh, here's a great question. Okay, if ish fish, 
she's, uh, or he has used my croissant recipe before and was curious, is it normal for the butter to leak out when baked? I have had that happen a lot too. And I find that can happen for two reasons. Um, not letting the, the croissant proof up before they go in the oven. So had I let the croissant just sit for an hour as opposed to two hours, then you'll find you get the butter leaking out. And I also find that by adding that bit of ghee or using European butter, if you can get it, the higher fat percentage, it, it stays in the croissant a lot better. So there's a double reason to try this regular butter plus ghee trick for your croissant. That's a great question. But ultimately, it comes down to the proofing time. Don't shortchange. I know, you know, you think you want croissant. Oh, let's make croissant. And then three days later, you're eating croissant. <laughs> so this is why you make a big batch and freeze them. So then you have them on hand. Great, great questions. Uh, hello from Mexico City. Oh, how do I know when the, oh, and I see a sourdough question too. I'll recap some of those things. Um, so when you're dissolving fresh yeast or conventional yeast in your liquid, when you stir it, you let it sit for a few minutes. When you stir it, it should go cloudy and basically disappear within Elm's height. The Elm's is, has TJ initials. Is everyone seeing me okay? We're good. We're just trying to make sure we're all connected here. Okay, we're back up. Awesome. That was just us on our end. All right, great. Uh, oh, a question was, oh, good. Do I freeze before or after I roll the croissant? I freeze after I roll them into their shapes. And if you're making um, almonds or chocolate ones too, I fill, roll, and then freeze. Um, just a reminder that you want them to thaw for a full hour and then proof for another two hours. So three hours proof time. You can really help yourself if you know you want to bake croissant in the morning, pull them out of the freezer and keep them in the fridge overnight to slowly thaw and then give them that two, maybe a little extra time. I'm going to take a peek at my croissant. I can smell them. Oh, hello. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to take a look? Who wants to take a look? That is after eight minutes of baking. Look at how they've puffed up. But we really want to coax that beautiful color and flakiness on the exterior. Uh, oh, oh, here, a note from TJ and everyone. If you're having trouble seeing the feed, refresh the page. Thanks, TJ. <laughs> I'm a pro baker. I can tell you all the technical aspects about croissant. Uh, sometimes I'm less so when it comes to this technology. Okay. Oh, hello from Devon, England. Oh, here, Amira, I'm trying to get to your note, but it's it's flying pies quickly. The dough rose up a whole lot. I'm trying to answer that question. Uh, uh, the question from Nigeria about scones. Um, so if you made my scones from last week and you said they were hard and you were waiting for them to brown on top, um, it may be, because I don't know about what your flour is like, that you may have to add a little more liquid so that your scones have room to move and make sure that oven is preheated to 375. So you get that lift right away. Hopefully that helps you out. And then you'll find um, you should get the proper browning. I hope you give them another try. Uh, do, do, do. Haley's asking, oh, where did I learn my French? Good old Canadian school system, grades one through 13. <laughs> and I wish I had kept it up more. I, I'm actually using some of this time we have uh, now that I am not commuting so much uh, and trying to improve my French. So appreciate the, the kind words of support there. Um, but I didn't study baking in, in France, but I love French baking. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, some people have to go do work now. I know. I know. Oh, we've been at this for almost an hour. I've got five minutes left and then I'm probably going to set the timer for another two minutes. But I want you to see these beautiful croissants. You know, I thought about baking some ahead of time. Then I thought, oh, what if you thought I was cheating and I went and bought them somewhere and then put them on a tray? I wanted you to see, because here we are live, that this is the real deal and I really am making them. Uh, Quick Cookie says, hello from LA. Uh, oh, Mildred asks, is it possible to have an OEM 101 on sausage making? Well, considering my husband wrote an entire cookbook based on pork called Living High Off the Hog, I think maybe we could do a combined one. We'll have to see. That's a very good suggestion, Mildred. Uh, okay. 
uh, being, oh, this is a great, great question. Asking if there is a standard formula for using a sourdough starter in place of conventional yeast. That is difficult be, without knowing what the starter base is um, and how strong it is. So um, when I use, uh, what I go by is a sourdough starter recipe. Um, and I, I, res I, instead of changing the formula, so I'll add the sourdough starter to the bread base. And if I don't have yeast to supplement, I add thyme instead of add changing the actual recipe itself. So where a sourdough bread with the addition of, you know, a half a packet of yeast um, would rise for two hours, I would probably give it three hours just to let that starter do its activity. Because the yeast, once it starts feeding, will keep feeding. And the longer you give your bread to rise, especially in the initial proof, the better it will be, the more flavor you'll get. So that was a great question. Hilda says, hi from South Africa. I really need to see you make croissant. Ah, well, the good news is this live video um, with all the intensive tips, all the different stages will be posted on OYUM so you can watch it later. And if you made that first step with me, you'll be able to come back to this, pick up where we left off and then keep going and going and going from there. So I hope you will come back and revisit it. And I really hope you will uh, share your photos. If you're making croissant, I wanna give you a pat on the back. So please post them on my Instagram or Facebook pages, hashtag OYUM101, and I will find them. And so I wanna check out your croissant baking and try this trick with the, the ghee. I'd love to see it work. And if you have the luxury of having 82 or 84% butter, well then you're all set anyhow. Uh, oh, here we go. The, Calvin is asking, Doe rose up, lives in Singapore. Is there something I should do? Uh, you know what, Calvin? Okay, I know you. it's hot and humid in Singapore, 365 days a year. So I think that's probably what was causing your dough to rise up so quickly. So you can reduce your proof time. So where my recipe says, when you do the first dough, let it rise for 90 minutes, cut that in half. Then you want to keep it, cold as long as you can. Um, cold butter right from the fridge, go right back in the fridge and then you should be able to work it, um, work through it. But that first proof, cut the proof time in half um, and then I think you'll find you have better control. If you still don't, then cut your yeast down because you, you uh, the, the weather in Singapore is so beautifully hot and humid. It is like a proofer, that moist environment and I have had the pleasure of visiting Singapore and Malaysia and cooking there so that was a very, very good question and I had I too had to adapt um, because it is so hot uh, oh and hello Lo from Singapore oh good question Trina what does overproofing mean uh, how does this happen and what does it look like so overproofing is when you've gone too far and so the yeast is pretty much consumed all the sugar that's within that bread dough that it's at the biggest volume and what happens is when it hits the heat of the oven the gluten in the flour can't hold it and you actually lose the air bubbles instead of keeping more of them or you have bread with big holes that is almost dry because the yeast has expended itself so to prevent this you basically want to check your dough um, along the way and if you can stick your finger in it and it doesn't spring back, that's the sign that it is properly proofed. If you see it start looking almost translucent on the surface, that's from, that was, that was my croissant, so I'll go check that in a second. Um, and it looks really pillowy, or when you touch it on the end and it collapses, that means it's overproofed. Doesn't mean you have to throw it away and start again. This is actually a great tip. Um, if it's a bread dough, you reshape it, so you knock out all that air, the yeast will then force itself up again, and so just keep an eye on the clock and probably half the pr proof time will fix it. So that was a great question to ask, Trina. Let's check on our croissant. <gasps> They're coming along. Now, something I found in North America, we tend to have lighter color croissants. So while these are fully cooked, they are acceptable, I love a really toasty croissant because I love when it shatters and goes all over the place. So I'm gonna leave it for another 
three minutes, um, which gives us more time to hang out. Uh, do, do, do. Oh, hello from Barcelona. Oh, here's a good question from Diego. How can I reduce sugar without compromising moisture and structure? Any perfect substitute? Well, you have asked a great question and you are already one step ahead because you realize that the sugar is not just for sweetness. Sugar lends moisture and structure to a recipe. If you made a meringue and didn't add sugar, it would completely collapse. It wouldn't hold its shape. Um, if the reason is for health concerns, uh, managing diabetes, one of my favorite options, depending on the state's uh, your own condition, is to use coconut palm sugar, which registers half on the glycemic index as refined white sugar, but it's a one-to-one -one substitution and it lends the structure and moisture and you don't have to change anything in the recipe. It is a natural brown color as opposed to the white sugar, so that's the only thing that changes. If you're trying to remove sugar altogether, my favorite alternative is agave syrup. Um, it's from a cactus plant. It's what tequila is made from. But as a syrup, it lends a delicious sweetness, but it still lends the moisture and structure to your baking recipes. Um, it is a little bit sweeter, so I, I reduce the amount. And being a liquid sugar, as opposed to a dry granulated sugar, you may have to tweak again. That's why I reduce it. But that was a great question. So we've got two great options, coconut palm sugar or agave syrup. Hello from Brazil. Hello to Trinidad. Uh, can I mix dry fruits in the croissant dough? Oh, Lalitha, that's a great question and a beautiful name. Um, I have never tried. I would be hesitant because I think bits of dried fruit in the actual dough itself would break that gluten and protein development. And I don't think you'd get quite the flakiness. What you could do, though, is in place of, say, an almond filling or chocolate filling, you could soak some dried fruits, add some spices, candied peel, if that's the flavor you're going for, put that in the center of the croissant, roll it and bake it, and then I think you'd be all set. And don't forget, you can go savory too. Put, don't be afraid to put some Emmental or cheddar cheese in the center of that croissant for a cheese croissant. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, Kathleen Peters, hello. So glad you could hang out, but I know people have to head out get on with their day. Good evening from South Africa. Hello. Oh, no, someone else from Singapore. You're staying up late or up really early. Staying up late, I think. Uh, hello from Australia. You're staying up late too. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, here's a question. Uh, Noel Draper is asking, how can I freeze chocolate crinkle cookies before and after baking? Um, you've got two options before baking. Crinkle cookies tend to be a very soft batter that you scoop using an ice cream scoop and roll in icing sugar. Um, you can pre-scoop those cookies and put them on a tray. Don't roll them in icing sugar. Freeze them on the tray first and then just pull them to pack them in the container to then thaw, roll, and bake later. Um, baked, you would probably lose the crispness of, of the surface. What I love about a crinkle cookie is it's got that crunchy outside and the soft, gooey center. The sweeter a cookie is, the less effectively it freezes baked. Um, if you are, then make sure you spread them in a nice, give them lots of space to breathe inside the container before you freeze them. But I would opt for freezing them scooped uh, and unbaked first. And they take up less room in the freezer. And then they're e the easy part is the baking, right? Uh, let me take one more peek at the croissant. Here we go. Yes, yes, yes. What do you think, Michael? Do I let them go a minute more or are you okay with these? No, we're gonna okay. I do not want to melt my laptop. <laughs> you saw it real time. You saw them go in 21 minutes ago. No, 18 minutes ago. And here they are. I might even be tempted to put them in the oven. I really like them toasty. I also like over dark pancakes and I have to toast my English muffins twice. So these are, these are so fragile and hot right now. In fact, I'll take some off the tray just to cool down faster, but look at that flakiness and we didn't lose no butter leached out, which is always a bit of a yes moment. Woo -ha. Okay. I have tough fingers. You can hear the, the flakiness actually sets in as the croissant cools a little bit. So it's tempting to eat them 
hot out of the oven like this, but you actually have to give it a minute. I'll rip into one so you can see, but you're gonna get more flakiness in about five minutes. Can you see the steam? You've got that soft, buttery center. It, that is way too hot to eat, but it's absolutely shattering. If you were to eat this in the car, it would go everywhere. Yes. <laughs> I am gonna grab one. I did bake a couple off earlier, but just to show you that once it cools, that's when the flakiness really kicks in. And then you get that soft center. Oh, so buttery. You don't need anything on it. Yes, Michael, you can have one. So these croissants, of course, are best enjoyed the day they're baked, but I've given you great tips for making these and then freezing them so you can pull them out and bake them when you want. Alternately, if they're day old, you can just pop them on a baking tray and in a 150 Celsius or 300 degree Fahrenheit oven, just warm them for about five minutes. You'll get a new crust on the, the top and you'll soften up that center beautifully so they can be enjoyed. How is it, Michael? Good? Uh, sure, I'll have to cut a cool one because the uh, hot ones will just. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, do a good close up on that. So that was without a machine, rolling by hand, but the trick really is in I think creating your own European butter by combining unsalted butter with ghee which is 100% fat to bring that fat content up and you can really you can smell that buttery goodness well I touched this one so this one's not for Bill and Bonnie it's for me so I hope you've enjoyed yourself and you asked great questions um Oh, one, I'm gonna take this one last one because it's a good question from Daisy. Why is flour added to the butter when the croissants is folded? Well, I only dust the surface when I'm rolling the, the base dough so it doesn't stick, but I try and keep excess flour away from it because I don't want it to interfere with the layers. Um, when you're making puff pastry dough, that's altogether different. So that might be another Oh Yum 101. I can tell you are just into the technical aspects. As you can tell, I am quite passionate about the technical aspects of baking. So I hope you'll join me next week. We're trying to switch up the time so we can meet different time zones. So please, if, if you can't catch it live, you can always catch the feed afterwards. It has been wonderful spending time with you. And now I better bake off some more croissants because I have to do some deliveries. It's been a real pleasure. Have a great rest of your week, everyone.